Thank you so much. Good morning. It's great to be with you. It's a real privilege. And thank you for that, those kind words about the EA. You know, just to add, since 1846, 175 years ago, the Evangelical Alliance was formed. Two reasons. Unite the church in its mission to the United Kingdom and give the church a clear and effective voice into every layer of society. Thank you for your membership here at the church. We're made up of 3,500 church members, 500 organisations and tens of thousands of individuals who stand together to say, let's make Jesus known. You know, right now in our culture, though, the individual memberships are arguably the most important. Why? Because people are growingly sceptical about institutions. So if you've never considered joining, might you consider joining? If you're an evangelical, that means you believe the Bible's the inspired word of God. Stop changing your Bible to fit your culture and start changing your culture with the truth on the pages of the word of God. If you believe the death and resurrection of Jesus is the single most important thing in human history. If you believe in the need for conversion, you know, you don't just uh, come to faith by osmosis. You get on your knees and you meet your saviour. And if you believe in the need for the church to be active in the world, making the world more like the kingdom, then you're an evangelical Christian, my friends. We need you to be part of our alliance. EAUK.org forward slash join us. Cup of coffee a month, three pound a month. Join as an individual or as a couple. And I promise you one thing. We'll do all we can to raise your voice alongside the voices of thousands and thousands of others as we speak into the corridors of power, as we seek to bring unity and mission, and as we together make Jesus known. Enough of that, let's move on. I'm sure you remember it really well. Saturday afternoon, about quarter to five, the Saturday before Christmas. Boris Johnson has the audacity to announce that he's cancelling Christmas. Now, with respect, uh, uh, the PM is a great man, but with respect, even he does not have that authority. But it was that moment I was sat around with my family. My children are devastated. They're looking forward to finally seeing grandparents for Christmas and seeing some friends for New Year in the wonderful opportunity that were those small bubbles we could have. It was all called off. It was all over. There were tears of children. There was secretly for me some joy that I wouldn't have to do the family stuff. And for my wife, she was devastated. We sat around our dining table. And we don't do this often, so don't start thinking we're wonderfully holy. But we just began to sing as a family a really little chorus that says, Our God reigns. Our God reigns forever. His kingdom reigns. You see, in that moment, when actually with hindsight, it's all right, we got over it. But in that moment, when it felt like everything was falling down around you, the truth of the matter is, in the middle of the storm, the God reigns. And what we need right now in the United Kingdom is a church that faithfully follows the Jesus that gave his life for them. Is a church that says, whatever we're facing, however good or however bad, he is on the throne and we will celebrate and worship him. You know, because I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. But I don't think the real hardness in the nation started yet. If this is a wave, what comes after COVID might be a tidal wave. But friends, let me tell you something. When the nation's in pain, the church has an open goal to rise up, speak up, act up, and show people what it is to stand on a rock of ages whilst others around don't know where to stand. So friends, if you've got a Bible, would you turn it on or open it up? We're going to go to 2 Timothy 2. I've just got... A few thoughts on what kind of faithful followers we need to be in this season and the next. If it's any help, it's page 1027 in my Bible. I'm going to read the first 10 verses of 2 Timothy 2. It says, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown, except by competing according to the rules. The hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I'm suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. 
You know, chapter 1 of 2 Timothy ends with, with Paul's reference to the widespread defection among Christians in the Roman province of Asia. Once Sephorus and his household seem to have been the exception. But now Paul urges Timothy that he too, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the general landslide, must stand his ground. Friends, right now, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of all the things going on, we must stand firm in the Lord. There is a call here to strengthen yourself by God's grace, not just get over it. I love that video about some of the well-being stuff you want to do. Actually, I particularly love the workspace piece. Why? Because you know what? So many people are lonely. And there'll be people who won't even have seen the issue, but they can come and have a shared workspace. Because, you know, we don't just get over what we're facing and crack on. It's by God's grace we continue. And, you know, this is Paul's last word to the church before he's killed. It's really interesting what he chooses to talk about. He wants future generations to continue in the fullness of the gospel without compromise. You know, if I felt one thing over the job that God has called me to, it's that. Share the fullness of the gospel without compromise, but do it with kindness and a smile. Paul focuses on Timothy's character and how he can develop it through the use of three occupations. Each of these help him grow and become more like Jesus. And we too are called to develop. And in verse 1, I love it, it says we're given the grace for it. This is not a time for Christian superheroes. It's a time for the Lord to give us the grace to be who we need to be for our nation. So these three, which I think are important. Firstly, he calls for the endurance of a soldier. This is verses one to four. One of the things we've done at EA during this pandemic is we've rung every church, all three and a half thousand churches, twice. Now, that's been quite an undertaking. But you know, it's been amazing to hear the work of the church locally. When I think of endurance, I'm drawn to one church I rang near Wembley. I rang them up to see how they were doing. And they said to me, the one thing they've done throughout the pandemic, every Friday night, from 8 p.m. till 4 a.m., they've prayed for the United Kingdom. Friends, that's endurance. I said, when are you going to stop? They said, well, when revival comes. They said, they're hoping it's soon. But, you know, we need to show some of the endurance of a soldier. A soldier does not expect a safe or easy time, nor should we. A soldier gives up the comforts and securities of the world and shows the discipline in order to see victory. We in this nation expect comfortable Christianity with uncomfortable results. Not going to happen. Around the world where the church explodes, it's because it's difficult to be a Christian. I do not want persecution here. But the more marginalised the church, the more likely a revival. And we've got to be prepared to keep going when it's not always easy. We should not expect an easy time. When you get opposition and ridicule, it's not quite a compliment, but it's normal. And I think for some of us, we just need to focus on who we serve. Jesus is our priority. Don't get me wrong, I want the world to absolutely love me. I really do. Wouldn't it be great to get loads of statutory honours and be recognised and everything else? But frankly, Jesus is my priority. We're doing this for Jesus. That's our focus. And you can't do big things if you get distracted by small things. You've just had a vision for a big thing, a four million pound facility to serve this community. You can't do that if you get distracted by small things. You know, distractions are so easy to find and so hard to lose. And what we need to do is is focus with the endurance of a soldier. That means we endure the season we're in. And it's for all people. It's not just for the people that look, sound and smell like us. It's for all people. Uh, My wife's a plastic scouser, which means she's from the Wirral. Now, the Wirral is the really posh place outside Liverpool. And everyone on the Wirral um, used to go on holiday to this place at the end of the Klim Peninsula called Abbasok. Now, Abbasok was really posh. You went by all these little Welsh villages, then suddenly it all got a bit Jack Wills. And in this sort of poshness was all of the Wirral. Now, I had young kids at the time, and they wanted to buy something. But the problem is, it was all to design a label for my charity wages. But finally, we found a shop called Bargain Bonanza. And I thought, we are in here. So I gave them both a couple of quid. They're like, wow, daddy, two pounds. I'm like, Lord, in your mercy, continue that forever. (laughs) And my daughter bought some stationery. And my son bought these little plastic soldiers, you know, with the parachutes you throw down the stairs. 
Except he got like three for two pounds. I used to get 30 for a quid. Anyway, we went back to where we were staying. It was near the beach. It was near a cliff edge with a fence. And my son says to me, can you throw the soldier all the way to the beach? I said, of course I can. So I got the soldier, I ran up and I threw it. And it flew about a metre and a half onto the open cliff face. And so I turn around to go and get another one from the house, but my son starts to whimper. <laughs> I turn around, he says, Daddy, we have to get that one. Pointing to the one on the cliff face. I said, why? He said, a soldier never leaves a man behind. I said, where did you get that? He says, Toy Story 2. <laughs> now, here's the thing, friends. Church can't leave people behind. We can't pick and mix who it is or who it's not. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you the limit on who you should reach. Everyone in Watford. Yeah. Let's start there, shall we? Amen. That'd be enough. Right. Let's see a revival here that transforms the nation. Yeah, but do not leave anyone behind. Right. We endure. We keep going. He has the victory. We belong to him. And if you ever struggle and you ever can't keep going, remind yourself of what I remind myself of. The end of the story. However many good things happen between now and the end of time, however many um, diseases are healed, however many pandemics are destroyed, however many World Cups England win, and not the oval ball, the proper one, the football, <laughs> however many bad things happen, however many wars, rumours of wars, however many pandemics there are, however many bad things or good things happen, the end of the story is the same. Jesus wins. Yeah. And the church has got to start living like it more, Amen. showing the endurance of a soldier. But secondly, the obedience of an athlete in verse 5. Again, ringing around churches. Incredible to see how many new visions are being had in this time. Incredible to see how many church plants are taking place. You know, you're doing a building project. This is probably the most stupid time to ever have done that. But the thing is, is the Lord is birthing new things. If the church is not needed now, it's never needed. And so we need to show obedience. To be a successful athlete, you have to train hard, obey the rules, and not be disqualified. The Lord is looking for those who will make sacrifices, who will obey him over their own wants and needs, who will go beyond their own desires and longings and go after the Lord's. Great moves of God are usually preceded by small acts of obedience. The biggest one of which is prayer. There's no record of any major move of God where you can't go back to finding four old ladies or equivalent who started praying every day for something ridiculous to happen. But little acts of obedience. Frankly, friends, like the athlete, we need to keep going. Now, now I'm a bit of a runner. Now, I'll be with respect. I'm no Tim Roberts. Right? I'm not a proper runner. I'm just a bit of a runner. But um, I like running, and I ran a little race against Mo Farah a few years ago. It's called the London Marathon. He beat me by quite a distance. But I ran the London Marathon, and I don't mind running sort of five or ten miles. That's fine, but marathons are hard. But if you train properly, it's okay. So the first half of it's fine. You get to 13 miles, you go over Tower Bridge, all good. As long as you've trained, there's not a problem. Then you have this demoralizing bit. You're running at 13, and at 23 miles the other way are the elite athletes. At 13 miles, you're looking like you're, you, you've seen better days. They, at 23 miles, they're just bouncing along, all graceful. Then what happens is you end up in Docklands, which is really, really boring. There are less crowds, it's dull. And people start doing what you must never do. When you run a race, never stop. Doesn't matter how slow you run, but don't stop. If you stop, getting going again is a problem. So people are stopping all around me. They're stopping for a stretch. Far better runners than me. Stopping to chat to someone, do something. They'll never get going again. I wasn't running fast, but I was sometimes running as slowly as they were walking. But my chances by not stopping of continuing were far higher. I remember as well, before the marathon, I decided I, I wouldn't take anything from anyone by the sides. When, it's, when I got to this point, I was taking everything. Anything you offer me, I was having some Vaseline, jelly babies, chocolate. Give me whatever you've got, I'll have some. Come on. But keep going, don't stop. Then you get to this point where you see the London Eye. The London Eye is bigger than I remembered. Because when I saw it, it was this big, I thought, I'm near the end. For the next three miles, it didn't seem to get any bigger. People are stopping, they're struggling. One thing I'd done, I'd said to my wife, Anne, do not tell me where you will be. Because you know how it is, fellas. You run a marathon, right? You walk 20 metres of it. That's the bit when your missus is stood by the side, isn't it? The rest of it, she's not seeing you. It's just when you're walking. And she says, oh, well done, fat boy. You can't even keep running. Um, 
So I said that to her, and there were various moments she popped up. Unfortunately, I was still moving, let's say, running, sort of. But people stopping all over the place. I'd done it to raise money for Youth for Christ, and um, I'd aimed to do it in under four hours. I had some problems, which meant that wasn't going to happen. But one particular giver had said, I'll give you a £1,000. I'll double it if you do it under four and a half hours. I get to the sign by the Mall, 200 metres to go. I look at my watch. Four hours, 29 minutes, 21 seconds. Now, I am built for power, not for speed. And so I don't sprint ever. But I thought, there's literally nothing I wouldn't do to raise £1,000 for young people to hear about Jesus. So I started to sprint. Now, me sprinting looked really ungainly. It was Kermit the Frog, limbs everywhere. Or if you prefer, Phoebe running in Friends as I'm going all over the place. And I get over the line in four hours, 29 minutes and 58 seconds. Boom! But here's the thing. It's not about time. It's not about anything else. It was just keeping going. And for some of us, you might not look that great if for yourself at the moment. You might be struggling, you might be finding it hard, but don't stop. Show the obedience of the athlete, one foot in front of the other. I believe the Lord is moving us to a place of maturity for what's to come. I do believe a major move of God's coming to the UK in my lifetime. But I also believe major challenge to the church is coming. Because the two go together. And he's preparing us for a time of maturity. He needs laid down lives like athletes running for the heavenly prize. I was so challenged. One of my closest friends is the holiest person I know. I wouldn't tell him that. That's not a good thing to do. You shouldn't have a league table of holiness. But he's a really holy guy. I spoke to him the other day. I said, what what are you doing to get ready for some of the unlocking in the nation? He said, I'm doing a 21-day fast. He fasts already loads. I'm thinking to myself, you're the last person to need to do it. Because I'm a sinner, you see. You look at it like that. He says, no, no, I'm doing this because I want to show the Lord I mean business. And I want to be ready for what's coming. And I want to show what it means to be a living sacrifice when it costs me something. Friends, I'm not suggesting that for all of us, but I'm saying, where where do you need to show the obedience of an athlete? Where do you need to lay down your own wants and desires to see the Lord do something? This is a time of being trained. Many people are saying there's going to be new levels of what God does, but alongside that, there'll be new devils of attack and challenge. Therefore, we need to be ready. We need to lean into Jesus more. New weapons for the battle. You'll never have a better chance than right now to learn holy habits. I'm, I'm slightly concerned because I need to start commuting a bit soon. Suddenly I'm going to lose lots of time. I better make sure that my practices are in place before that commuting kicks in. You know, it takes six weeks to develop any habit. What habit do you need to develop to get closer to Jesus? If your Bible reading's gone to sleep, just reawaken it. If your prayer life doesn't feel as natural as any muscle, crack on, start again, dust yourself down. But we need to be shown the obedience of an athlete. I also think that us Christians, we expect the world to respect things that we don't show respect for ourselves. We need to get serious about I know it's out of fashion, but serious about our spiritual disciplines. Because we need to go deep enough with Jesus that we've got what we need to keep going in the storm. So endurance of a soldier, obedience of an athlete, and thirdly, the patience of a hard-working farmer. This is verse 6. We need the patience because it won't all happen in an instant. Some of us want everything to have happened yesterday. But sometimes we need to just wait and allow the Lord to do what the Lord wants to do. You know, for years we've been wanting to see loads of people come to faith, but maybe now's the time. Because the, the ground is ready. Also, um, again, ringing around churches, I was blown away by this church in Stafford. They've been running a food bank for 15 years. They were running a food bank before the words food bank had been come up with. They just called it a food bank once they knew that's what they were supposed to call it. Before that, they just gave food to poor people. That's the way he put it. And it's never really caught the traction it could have done until this season. They've been plowing away in this ministry, and they felt the Lord say to them at the start of lockdown, go further with this. And what they've got now is, instead of having a food bank that was just serving a few families, they've got 32 homes across Stafford with a wheelie bin at the end of their drives. The majority of these homes are not Christian ones. And the wheelie bins are portable food banks that are getting filled up two or three times a week because the need is so great and the church has gone out of the building. And what they've found is the greatest witness they do is is they'll say to someone with a rather large house, do you know what, guys? Um, I promise you we'll get this filled. Would you mind if we put a food bank to help people at the end of your drive? Then when they go to collect it, there's the chance to pray. There's the chance to witness. They've got this amazing thing going on. But they've been doing this ministry for, for loads of years without seeing fruit. And suddenly the fruit's ridiculous. Pastor said to me, 
Four of his top ten givers during COVID are not Christians. Because they've been so blown away by this. I said it's a bit cynical to target the biggest houses. He said the biggest houses get the most people giving. But you know what's amazing is for years they've done a ministry, but then bang, God's done something. Don't stop just because you're not seeing immediate results. The Bible is full of people waiting for a lot longer than we've got left to live probably. And sometimes we have to wait. But we work hard like the farmer who patiently waits for the crop. Strong foundations for the future, not just in ministries, but in relationships. Go deeper with people. The time of going to church for an hour and a quarter, running home and not talking to anyone's over. We need community. In this season, you can get your content anywhere, you know, but you can't get community anywhere. We need a depth of relationship with each other that we work out for the long term as well. With your kids too. We've tried this with our kids. Any parents watching this, I bet you can't wait till children's work restores fully and youth work. But in the meantime, no longer should you expect any adult to do in an hour a week what you haven't done in 15 years. We need to go deep in relationships with our own kids, in our own households, in our own neighbours, in our own communities. This is a time to make your street, your parish, your garden fence, your pulpit, and to go deeper. The Lord is looking for those who love him, who will linger with him, and who will develop others. He's looking for disciples, not converts or consumers. Converts and consumers are yesterdays. You know, when someone says to me, I didn't get much out of the worship, and you're just like, please, we don't gather to worship you. You know, the idea of me not getting much out, that's gone. The church needs to go to the least, the last, and the lost, not to think, how do I get spiritually fatter whilst the world around me knows nothing of the risen Messiah? You know, as well, in this season, secularism offers no hope. I did a debate with two secularists. And if you do a debate where you know you haven't got loads to say, but you know you've got something good to say, don't speak much. Because right at the end, they'll come to you. So the host comes to me at the end and says, what do you think about what these uh, two guys have been saying? I said, "Um, I just find it really upsetting. I find it really upsetting at the time when our nation most needs hope. They've got absolutely no offer of hope to make. I find it really upsetting that, that these agendas and views that the government and others are using as normal and as orthodoxy for our nation offer no hope in a time of pandemic. Yeah. And I find it so strange because everything I believe, stand for and give my life to is about hope, you see, because hope has a name. His name is Jesus. Yeah. Friends, you've got to witness. Why? Because all these other ideologies everyone's been saying exist and are, and are right and are, are what we should be going after don't work in a pandemic. In a pandemic, people have looked for Jesus. Those who put their roots down deeply now will survive future storms. Friends, like the patient farmer, work at your land so you're ready for what is yet to come. Finally, Paul is chained in this moment. There's an amazing image. You know, when it comes to scripture, always ask yourself, not what does it say, what does it look like? Because I think scripture is so vision, it's amazing. Last Sunday was Easter. What's the first thing Jesus does when he's resurrected from the dead? Anyone you know what Folds up dirty washing. He does in the Gospel of John. Jesus is in two sheets. He folds one up. Mary and Joseph raised him really well. At some point he thinks, hang on, I'm the saviour of the world. He doesn't fold the second sheet. That's an amazingly visual moment. We've got another one here. Paul's in chains. He's in chains. And he is saying this. Though I am chained, the word of God, the mission, the gospel is not... He is there in chains, soon to die, and he talks about the unchained gospel. The nation is under restrictions, but the gospel is not. Verse 9, God's word is not chained. We've got an unchained gospel. People thought, what would this do to the church this last year? Well, a year and 14 months ago, not one online alpha in the UK. Four and a half thousand now. Christianity Explored have found similar growth. Online church has gone through the roof in some places. Mortality salience has kicked in. You know that 5% of the population go to church? Half of those have not been this year, this calendar year. But 25% of those who never go to church have been this calendar year. What a strange time. It's like for for those who are already saved, we're like, well, we don't really like church anymore because it's not the style we liked. But for those who've never been, they're like, boom! (laughs) In all this pain, there's Jesus. And and we're living with mortality salience. That's normally reserved for a war zone. Mortality salience is an awareness of the fact you're going to die. It's an awareness of the fact that that life is fragile. 
But when you have a year where excess deaths are reported on the news every day, you get mortality salience not in a war zone, in a world where we just have to sit on our sofas. And you know that people around you are asking the questions you've been answering for 30 years when they weren't asking them. We're living in a time that the next 12 to 18 months are vital to the gospel in this nation. So the soldier portrays a sense of priority. The athlete models discipline. And the farmer is a pattern of perseverance. I think the church desperately needs all three of these right now. In verse 7, we're encouraged to reflect and ponder on these three things. Priority, discipline, perseverance. That an unchained gospel could be shared with the world in need. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, I just want to pray for those watching this, for whom, if they were honest in their heart of hearts, you have not been their priority in recent days and weeks. You've been their king, but you've not been their priority. I pray, Lord, that you would take back your space, that where we are now, we would uh, relinquish control to you and allow you to be our priority in this season and the days and months and years to come? Would we show the endurance of a soldier in giving up our comfort to make you central? Lord, for others watching this, maybe they need the greater obedience of an athlete. Lord, I really want to pray even now you'd reveal to people what rhythms, disciplines could they be taking up in this season? Would they know, Lord, that you're cheering them on, helping them keep going? But I do pray, Lord, that you would be showing people what they could be doing, Lord, to be more like you. Help us to get the kind of relationship with you that would survive in the years and months ahead. And Lord, if there's new visions you want to release, help us to have the ears to hear them, even when it might sound bonkers. Lord, For those of us that need patience, like the farmer, I pray you'd help us. Help us, Lord, in those relationships where we've shared you for so many years and it feels like there's so little fruit. Help us to keep going. Help us to to trust you and help us to put down our own roots in you that mean we'll survive whatever storm comes our way. Finally, Lord, we pray for the unchained gospel. I pray for an open goal of an opportunity for every one of us to share something of you with someone who doesn't know you this week. Lord, whether it's in conversation or whether it's using one of these many pieces of technology, Lord, I thank you that we have all learned to be technical in the last year. And I pray you'd help us to use what's available to share your gospel. And get forwards, Lord. I pray for Wellspring. I pray, Lord, that this place would be a place where many, 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 many people say, I surrendered my life to Jesus as a result of hearing from someone else in the pandemic or in the months and weeks after. I pray over this new facility, Lord. I pray that you would provide the resource, but I pray, Lord, that you would keep the ministry of that work in line with your heart and there would be no missional creep from what you want to do in this place. And we pray for Watford, Lord, a place that sometimes is just seen as a town on the edge of London. Lord, would this be one of those places that church history writes about, because you do something ridiculous. Not for us and our ego, not even for Watford, but for your kingdom. And Lord, I pray that you would bring greater unity of church, greater unity of purpose, and I pray that your church together would make you known for your glory. Amen.